Hello. Yeah, and that's my talk, speeding up your bills with the remote bills helpers. And yeah. <laughs> so that's me, I'm Enrique. I'm an Android dev at uh, TransferWise. That's my uh, Twitter handler. I don't tweet a lot, but you can follow me if you want. So yeah, let me explain the situation first. So I guess everyone here speaks uh, emoji language, right? or any native emoji speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so let me explain. So sometimes uh, this common situation, we check, uh, open our Android Studio, check out our code, uh, it indexes, it takes some time. We click on the play button, it, uh, it starts um, uh, building. It uh, starts sounding like uh, it's a plane like it's about to, to take off. It gets really, really hot up to a point where you could fry an egg on it and it, it takes forever, right? Not a very cool situation, but I think people relate to that. So, have a solution. Just buy a more expensive laptop, right? That's the easy one. So, yeah, you go to your IT support uh, department, you say, hey, just give me a, another laptop, and they, obviously, they are going to give you one, right? That's straight away no problem at all. Well, that's not always is the case, right? That they say, oh, we, d we bought these laptops this year, they need to last like another three years, so mm, you need to stay with that one for a couple of years. So, I propose an alternative, and I say an alternative to, to that, but uh, a dis little disclaimer here, you should um, make your bills as efficient and, um, as possible. This is not saying, I'm not going to say you shouldn't be trying to modularize or, or, I don't know, get rid of the annotations in your projects. You, you should still do those things and try to reduce your build time as much as you can. But this is an extra thing that could help you if you cannot go and say, give me a super expensive laptop. So how this works, you just send your source code to a remote build, to a remote server, it, it uh, compiles and you get the result back, the, the build files back. Uh, yeah, it, I got, last time I did this talk, I got the question, is this like a CI? Not quite, because you use it differently, but uh, I could elaborate on that a bit later. And I'm going to uh, talk about the requirement first. What do you need on the server side? You need um, a Linux server with no graphical user interface, or at least that's what I suggest, because why are you going to uh, waste your, your, your computer cycles on, on rendering Windows and stuff, right? You need an SSH server, that's, uh, so you can uh, connect to that machine and sync the files. You need uh, the Java and, and the Android SDK. And on the client side, it's very similar. This is going to work for Linux, um, um, uh, or, or OS X, or Mac, or whatever. Um, Windows, and the requirement that we have is an SSH client, our NARSync, that is a program that has been there for, for ages to sync files between Locally, I'm, 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 I'm between computers that uh, works on the top of an SSH when you do it uh, between remote um, computers and as I say, it works on all those platforms, but there's a little bit of a problem on Windows that we can talk about that later. So the first approach. So the, the first time I tried to do something like this was like a few years ago, like four years more or less. I was working from home with my small laptop, like a 15 inches one that uh, wasn't very powerful, is, is my point. And the build was taking forever and, um, and I thought I had a, a desktop computer, my wife's computer was there and I say, why don't I try installing Linux here and see, and see what I can do? So uh, I did that and my first approach was very rudimentary in a way. So I was doing this, uh, this tool, rsync, to, to uh, synchronize the whole project with this uh, remote server. Then I was doing, I was connecting the device directly into that machine, and then from uh, sending a command by SSH to, to run after I sync, to run and then build and then install <coughs> the project into the device. 
um, yeah, and I tried also doing the the installing of a TCP like wirelessly, but that took a little bit too much to to send the the APK and um, yeah, I rather just do it connect it directly. So how was this? This was a bit of a hassle. I had to have like two separate screens, one for for syncing the the whole project, and I was doing this rsync. Uh, you're gonna see that I'm gonna show the the, the recipe and the, an example of the command in all those kind of screens that you're gonna see. And yeah, you, you do rsync from the the part in the, your workspace to the remote um, server workspace. Then on another screen, I was running the commands. Well, I was SSHing to another machine, running the commands on that screen. Uh, like a assemble debug or whatever Gradle um, task you're using to build your, your project. <coughs> Installing and then running it. Easy, but just seems to be like a lot of um, a lot of commands you have to write, a lot you have to type, right? So, yeah, then a few years later I met uh, someone that, that showed me how to use this um, script that is called mainframe. That uh, w what uh, I didn't mention, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna present two, two alternatives to that. The first one is a bit uh, too rudimentary, but I'm gonna present two, two solutions that are a bit more a bit more realistic, a bit more easy to use, and um, this is the first one. This mainframe script, it has been there for a few years. They, I think they are working on, on the version three of the, of the script, uh, that has been rewritten in Rust and it does some improvements, but I think it's not there yet. But the concept changes here a little bit. So what you do is you, you pass um, a command uh, to this uh, as an argument to this uh, mainframe script and what it does it is, is underneath it uses rsync it does the, the syncing of your all, all your workspace it, and it syncs back and then later you can you can do and run your adb commands and, um, and yeah and install and run the, the, the project in the in the device so this is going to be a bit more simple than before, but um, yeah, it's, that's uh, how I uh, said it was. So it's the script plus the, the parameter. One, one thing I have to say is you can pass any, any command that you want it to run. So this could even be a potential thing that you could use for iOS if you have an iOS server. So it's one of the advantages of mainframe. And yeah, you do the ADB install and, and run that. But again, it seems to be like a lot of uh, command line that you need to type, right? So, super cool. Yeah, and let, let's see how it runs, like a demo of how it works. You type the command. Yeah, I'm so slow typing. <laughs> And it does that syncing, and then it runs like if it, it like if you were running this on your local machine, but on, on a remote machine. And um, if it finishes, sorry, I took a very slow one. And it syncs back, and it tells you how long did it take. So yeah, that's it. So a solution for that, uh, uh, solution. another alternative to that is uh, another solution for this remote, um, um, remote service building your app is uh, the Miracle plugin, which is a little bit different from, from the mainframe script because it's, uh, it's a Gradle plugin. So you put it on your Gradle configuration and what it does is any Gradle command that you type, uh, it will run on the remotely. We're gonna see how we configure that later but it's basically that it does rsync, exactly the same thing, that's how it works but it does it uh, directly on a plugin, You do, it's completely transparent and the same thing and you know how it works. See that green button over there? You just click it. So kind of easy right? That's, you, I wasn't gonna bother you with all those commands on this one so that's um, a good solution if you don't like the command line as much as, as I like. 
And yeah, let's go through the configuration. On the server side, you need to choose a, a Linux distribution and install it. I'm not going to go through how you is install it. that. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of tutorials online on, on how to do that. Uh, you, you need to install Java, you need to install the Android SDK, and need to make sure that you have uh, the SSH server installed. And that's one important thing that you need to do, is creating a user for every, every developer that is going to use this machine. I found, I actually develop or work on a, an alternative to this, but uh, let's leave it in things like this for, for the time being, for, for, in, for the sake of making things easy to understand. And you need to do, you need to add this, so when you run these commands, they know where the the root and the well, of the SDK is, and you don't have a problem building things. On the client side, it's um, it's simple. You need to to generate uh, the RSA key. If you don't have one, that most people have for for Git, you need to co uh, copy the public key to the remote server. You need to create uh, the SSH config file and and then check that you can SSH in, into into that remote machine very easily. That's the, the command for, for generating the RSA key. This, uh, oh, I have something here. Oh, no, it doesn't work. And you, you copy using that SSH copy ID and you Vim into that command. I say Vim, but you can use any editor. I particularly love Vim, but uh, you can use any editor. You need to do the SSH add that uh, sometimes when rebooting, unless you add a bit in the configuration, and then uh, you try to, to SSH into that machine. I, I tend to, to call this uh, machine uh, mainframe, but uh, you could um, call it whatever you want. But it, it, it has to match the, the same one that... Um, it doesn't reflect shit, sorry. The same one that you put in your configuration has to be the same one that you have uh, there when you SSH into, into that. Then that's the, the, the common configuration, but then we need to configure uh, each tool uh, separately, right? So for mainframe, you just need to download the script, and that I, I will show it in the, in the links at the end. You need to put it in, on your project. On version 3, and they are going to make it independent from the project, so you won't have to do it on every single project. And then configuring the GNOME files. The GNOME files are very uh, similar to the, the Git GNOME that you have, but um, you basically need to to specify what you want to go to to sync when it uh, it goes from from your local machine to the remote and back. And then you you have also common ones. Um, what do you want to to put there in the in the remote one? On the local to remote one, you only want to sync the source. So you will put, ignore all the bills generated, all that kind of stuff. And uh, from remote to local, you will ignore the, 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 like the images, the source code, um, all of that kind of stuff. And aliases that are optional, but it's a way, so you don't, it's kind of, uh, I don't know if you know what aliases, aliases are, but it's, a, it's kind of a command line shortcut. So you don't have to write those massive uh, commands that I saw at the beginning. You could do, I'm going to share uh, some at the end or when I share the slides. But um, it makes things easier, like you, you type bill and it does everything, it orchestrates that for you. So that I think is uh, a good way of not having to write that much uh, command line. Um, Yes, uh, and that's how you download the, the config file, the, what you will mostly put on the, on the config file, uh, on the configuration of mainframe, and the GNOME files, as I said. Like typical idea file, local.properties, because local.properties in, in the remote machine won't work, and that's why we, we set the path to them, to the SDK, and then build source. On the on each one, um, aliases. Yeah, I have a few here. Like um, I have one called install debug that does <coughs> um, does the installation on ADB. One that runs the app 
and then I do combinations of those, like uh, the one that is called MF Build. It does the your uh, building a command plus the installing and, and running. So by typing that, you will you need to compose this yourself because it depends on each project. But it will by uh, writing one command, it will do everything. But uh, on Miracle, you just need to again, you just need to to click on the um, uh, green triangle, right? On the play one, and in Miracle is is quite easy. That is just adding this configuration. That host um, over that has to be the, the same one that you put on, on your SSH file. And a thing I forgot to mention is this is kind of compatible with mainframe if you have it in your project. And if not, you need to add the ignore files in here. But that's on the you can see that on their website. It's very easy to do. Yeah, and. Um, <laughs> the Windows problem that I mentioned before, uh, that, that asterisk that I saw at the beginning, I, I tried to make it work with Windows and I did, but I found some problems. So these are the, well, the, the problem is that there's no, um, SSH is, uh, is, uh, is now native on Windows from Windows 10. It's been there for a couple of years, I think. But they they don't have rsync or at least they don't have it natively, so you need to to find alternatives to that. So the possible solutions, the first one, just get a MacBook. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you went this way. Just joking. And uh, then you have these two. Uh, mean GW, I think is uh, minimal uh, GNU. Uh, I don't quite remember how it stands for. Uh, Sigwin. But those two, are like, like, and they are like, um, um, how do you call that? Um, software suites, yeah, software suites that uh, provides uh, Linux tooling to, into Windows. So you have things like rsync. The only problem I found with those is the, the implementation of uh, SSH wasn't that that good, and it wasn't um, uh, using all the threads that it could use in parallel, and so the syncing was taking more. So it kind of defeats the point and it was taking in more to sync the files from remote uh, to, to the local machine when you were done. So, so it was actually bigger than, than building locally. So no, no point on that. In, in the examples I work on, another example, it might be different. Then another alternative is, is Docker. So you could have a, a Linux, a Linux um, uh, install underneath your, your windows or on the top of your windows. Because Docker and and the other solution, I think that these two are very similar. That this uh, Docker and w, uh, USL Windows subsystem for Linux, um, but I recommend WSL because it's so easy to install and it is I found it super cool that you could you can actually have Linux installed in your Windows with like using the without having to use a virtual machine. That's because I think that's how it works. Those two, Docker and WSL, is um, Windows provides the um, like the functionalities of the Linux kernel or something. If there's a Linux expert, sorry if I'm not being too accurate on that, uh, very accurate on that. But it, it's kind of that. And so you uh, Win, uh, Windows provides an abstraction layer, and then you install distributions. I think, and yeah, it's very easy to install. And you just need a power cell and, and type that uh, command and then you can choose i mean you might not be able to to install any distribution that easily but you can like the typical ones are there i personally use debian because i, I love it but uh, you, you have a lot there and um yeah that was the linux problem and uh, i'm going to talk about some useful tricks that i had in different slides but i reduce it because i think we're going to run out of time or we okay okay so far, so good. So, yeah, I've got uh, some useful tricks that I have used to, to improve this or, or make the experience better. So, one is um, MDNS, DNSSD. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but um, when you have one of those remote machines on your local network and you need to type the, the IP address and you, you need to know the IP address of that machine and sometimes if you reboot it, you lose that IP address. So one solution is having um, uh, one of those uh, servers, um, a DNS, a MDNS server. So it could be 
resolvable. Like you give it a name and you can do all the mainframe that local and you can hit that machine without having to know any IP address. Um, extend uh, use of aliases, aliases. I think you can use them for a lot of things like enabling and disable Miracle, that's something I forgot to mention, but once you configure Miracle, you have the problem when you go home and you are on the train or and you cannot reach that remote machine. It's, it's gonna, every time you, you, you try to build on your Android Studio, it's gonna try to reach that machine. And the only way of, um, um, the, the only way of uh, going around it is um, passing a, a parameter on your Gradle commands, but if you are on the IDE, you are not passing any parameter, you just click in a green button, so unless you create your custom tasks, you will have to, um, you, you, you cannot do it. And uh, so you can have an, an alias, and I'm gonna show, I'm gonna, when I share this, I, I'm gonna uh, show, uh, give some, some links to some gists where you can, you will have that, um, that aliases that uh, for enabling and disabling that. That is just renaming the config file. Simple as that, but I think it's, it's useful. Uh, the syncing multiple steps, that's something kind of a hack to the, to the, um, um, to the mainframe script that I did once, that is basically you uh, modify the, um, the GNOME files to just sync the APK when you go oh, back because you are maybe changing something and and and, and you're not gonna have to, you don't you don't want to to sync all the build files to to just uh, run it on the emulator you need the, the build files so you don't break enter the studio and things get red and ugly but you could do that later so you could uh, have uh, an alias that just changes all those remote files that runs the, the task that you want to do and then seems things but it's kind of a hack the other the other alternative is just to modify the script and i have to say that in mainframe v3 they were doing something like uh, they were trying to do something like you are building your your app and as it is building it is syncing so when it finishes building you, you will already have the, the files maybe it's missing the last file but uh, it's more efficient Another one is uh, a bash script for new starter. I saw a lot of configuration that might be super boring and every time someone joins your company have to go through that, that might be a pain, you know, it might be a bit, it doesn't make sense. You need to do, you need to do like a lot of complicated things. You just need to do it once and you're gonna forget about, so what I'm trying to say is have some, it has some learning curve and it's kind of, it is kind of uh, too much for for that, and everyone has to do it. So you could have a bash script that uh, does the, the configuration for 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 its new starter, and it does all the configuration that I say, but for 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 your your project in your company, I've done it and it it works, and I am working on one, so I can share it with people. But um, yeah. The dynamic user creation, so if you remember what I said before, it's you need to create a user every time someone joins, which is a bit of a, a pain. You, everyone has to, uh, someone has to uh, uh, log in on that machine and create, manually create that user. And then that, that needs to be done. And if your company is changing all the time, that could be a bit painful. One way of dealing with that is just, uh, making the dynamic user. That's a bit more complicated. I needed to follow a tutorial to do that, but I managed to do that. And that if your company has like Active Directory, LDAP or Kerberos or any of those things, it works. Then SSH tunneling, uh, like that, that is mainly for management. Like you have, uh, but it could be used also for, for building remotely. But imagine you have a machine that is not reachable uh, uh, by some people in the company, but it is reachable by others. But you, you could, but you can see one part of the of the network or something like that. So what you could do is you can make a tunnel, a tunnel, an SSH tunnel, 
to a, um, a server that is common to everyone and then you can jump between between them and for management is a is a is a very useful thing and that uh, SSH done anything and then cron jobs is also another thing like like very recurring thing like everyone uses them for for like crazy things yeah I've I've used it, I tried to, I had like a weird problem, I remember having a cron job like to restart things like um, every couple of days because uh, it, sometimes it gets a bit um, dirty when, when you when you are running that for, for like lots of people running that, uh, using that remote machine and it uses, uh, it, it um, it leaves a lot of the dev processes sometimes and it doesn't clean after itself so that's a way of doing it or you could create a cron job maybe for cleaning the, the RAM maybe I don't know some other way and to create reports that's another thing that you could do with cron jobs but those were on the top of my head the useful tricks that well, what was it animating twice <laughs> sorry and yeah but and yeah and let me talk about the last slide about uh, advantages and disadvantages. So one of the advantages is that your laptop doesn't get too hot and, uh, and even battery lasts longer. So you could be without uh, going with your laptop without using your, uh, your charger and, and, and it's going to last longer. That's, that's a cool thing. And yeah, sometimes uh, because of the, the uh, using this, you can do more things. Your the, the IDE doesn't become unresponsive. You can still do do stuff. And um, you can do things even if you don't don't want to use this for normal builds. You, you could even use it to to run like long long tasks. Like maybe your the unit test take for uh, take forever or at least to to start because they have, I don't know, some old framework or something and they, they take a lot. So you can just uh, fire that and you could keep coding. That's another advantage. The disadvantages is slow networks where you depend a lot on the network. If your network is a bit not very good, a bit crappy, and it's kind of, it kind of defeats the point because it's, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna take more time in, in syncing back and, and then you rather build it locally. Um, it requires uh, its configuration for every new developer un unless you do that trick I show you. Um, yeah, this is an issue that I found um, sometimes. Sometimes you start uh, changing branches and then you screw up the, the whole workspace. And the thing that you can do is just uh, log in and delete the workspace in the remote machine and it, it requires a bit of maintenance so that's that's one of the, the disadvantages but uh, on the top of my head at least some links Mark Allison the styling Android I don't know if you know him he's um, he wrote that um, that post on, on his um, on, on his blog about uh, mainframe and miracle interesting one the Vala that is somewhere over there wrote the um, that was the person who introduced me to mainframe uh, wrote a very interesting article about um, uh, how to configure mainframe like but very long how to do it step by step and uh, he was the, the only difference is he, he was using um, uh, docker images on the remote uh, servers but it, it is a good start and this the, the mainframe repo the miracle repo the link I, I follow for uh, the Active Directory, the dynamic user creation thing, and as I say, it's a link that you can always search online. Uh, I always need to search that because I, I, keep, I always forget if, if it's a uh, local, remote, remote local, so I need to check online. Um, thanks. And yeah, that's comic sense. And I'm not going to apologize for that, so. <laughs> Any questions? Hi, thank you for that. Um, a couple of quick questions. So 
do you have any performance metrics on how this made it actually easier life on a day-to-day -day basis, and how does it impact debugging on a again a day-to-day -day basis on how you work with this um, implementation? Oh. Do you need to have Michael? Have Michael? Oh, sorry, and we need to go back and forth. <laughs> So the problem with metrics is I couldn't show anything because uh, all that work, that uh, all the tools I, I saw, I, I used them on, on a previous company. And I don't work there anymore. I cannot say anything about build times. But I can say that uh, it was, um, I can say, between a MacBook uh, 15 inches and, and having a remote machine with 32 gig, i9, that kind of thing. It was three times faster, the, the whole build, the whole journey. You sync, you build, and you go back, like uh, th three times faster, which I think is, is uh, a good improvement. And uh, you were also asking about debugging, right? Um, like uh, using the debugger and putting breakpoints I don't, I haven't used it, uh, uh, like main framework for instance, you cannot use unless you know all the commands, like you need, there's an ADB command to, to run it and to run the, the app in uh, debug mode, but that, that seems again a lot of hassle. But on the, on Miracle works with that, Miracle works, the Miracle plugin. And yeah, I haven't used it in, in a while, but uh, uh, sometimes when I'm debugging, I, I, I do it locally, but um, that's true. Any more questions? Thanks, very nice talk, thank you very much. Um, have you used it in a big company where you have like uh, 20 developers cooperating on the same project and the same developers trying to build at the same time? Yes. Um, and the second question is, would you recommend it for TransferWise or for Light? I'm trying to, to configure that. Well, this is my pitch for, for, for <laughs> TransferWise. So I joined recently, so I haven't had the time to, to configure all these things for, for the team. But I, I have green light and I'm going to get a machine at some point and, and start with that. And, but um, I'm talking a bit about uh, scaling up. What I have to say is that um, when I started using this on a previous company, we were less a few developers and then the uh, company started growing. So what we start having is more machines. So you allocate people to different machines. That's the, the way we, we solve the, the issue. I, I thought or I tried to, to do some kind of um, SSH load balancing, but I, I couldn't find a, a, an easy way of doing it and I didn't have time to do that, but it's an idea for if everyone wants to play with, if you can find a solution for that to, to scale up. But I, I do recommend it for, for big companies, but you need more than one machine. Any more? Okay, yes. Hi, thank you for the speech. Um, I was wondering if there's any nowadays with the uh, latest version of Unreal Studio, um, which what takes the longest is the first build, and then you can use like uh, instant run or incremental build or stuff like that. So, so yeah, what's the impact at the end? I mean, once you have done the first build, do you really see a um, major improvement still or develop building time? So yeah, interesting question. So it, it depends a lot uh, on the project, I have to say. But uh, I, I've seen people that once uh, they, they, they release this uh, instant um, uh, incremental, how is it called? Instant run? Or oh, that was how it was called before. Instant run, right? Um, it was actually better if you were doing it locally like that. Still, you can use it for other things like running tests in parallel. So it's still va valid, but uh, 
Yeah, it's a bit, um, yeah, it depends on the project. But if it's going to take longer to, to sync back, and that might not be what you, you need to maybe evaluate on a project to project basis, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I've seen those cases, but I still, uh, even using that, it was working fine for me. I was with the instant run uh, using the Miracle plugin. It worked, and I think it was same speed. Okay, thank you everyone very much.